lasting peace, built on justice and understanding among nations. This is the objective of the United Nations. This is another program in the United Nations series of the Pacific Story, one of the five special series presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations to further world unity and world peace through understanding. For hundreds of years, the Pacific and the lands it touches have been the scene of struggle, conflict for gain and power, people against people, and the millions caught in the political and economic cross currents. Today, with most of the world's population concentrated around and in the Pacific, the events of the Pacific are a vital world concern. The Pacific Story dedicates this series to the objective of the United Nations, lasting peace built on justice and understanding among nations. I fill my oh. second sack of rice, old one. Oh, your bones are younger than mine. The harvest is rich. There is ample time, Wade. No, no, there is not enough time for all that must be done. We must provide food not only for each one, but for many other provinces. Oh, already there is too much noise and bustle. Even now that the war with Japan is over, I long for the good old days of quiet. The old days are gone, old one. Golden's each one cannot look back. We must look ahead to the new days. It is our province, ours each one, that will be the heart of the new China. A young man and an old man gather rice in the great Chengdu plain of Zichuan. Here in the fertile, well-irrigated fields, people swarm 2,400 to the square mile. Wartime added to their numbers. War did many things to the once isolated Zichuan richest and most populous province in China. For the opening of the back door to fortress China may well have opened a great new age in the 3,000-year-old history of China. Ah, too many people have come to Sichuan, Weilong. Far too many. Even now, with the coastal cities back in our hands, most of them remain here. How can we feed them all? We fed them during the war, old one. We are feeding them today. We will continue to feed them and those of other provinces tomorrow. There are no beggars in the cities of each one. Too many people. Fifty millions in our own province alone, it is told. And babies are still being born. You are young, Wei, but you journeyed much during the war. Tell me, who will feed the old mouths and the new mouths which come into the land each day? The good soil of Golden's each one will fill the mouths and the bellies of our people. The soil is rich here, yes. And the crops great enough for our own province now. But with more to feed, what will happen then? Oh, life was less confusing in the old days. The old days of sleep are done with. China has awakened. We must increase the yield of our crops. We must have more wheat, more barley... Oats and millet in our winters. We must raise more rice, maize, sugar, mulberry and oranges in the summer monsoon. Yes, and we must grow more hemp and tobacco and add to the number of wax trees. But how will this be done? Already the yield here is great because of our superior irrigation system. Did you know that this system was created 23 centuries ago by the great engineer Li Ping? Uh, yes, old one, I have heard the story often. It cannot be told too often. For this Li Ping was a giant. With dams, dikes, and ditches, he harnessed the waters which the torrential rivers 
carried down from the Tibetan plateau. He distributed these waters throughout the plain. That is why our earth is good and our harvest rich. But how can we increase the yield from the already superior? Leaping, Leaping accomplished a great work for his time. It is not enough for our time. Ah, these are ill words. Most disrespectful of a great ancestor. Well, I, I mean no disrespect, old one. Li Ping's irrigation system is indeed a wonder. But it is not enough. Not enough? How can you speak thus? Each one has six million acres of rice land. Only one-tenth of this is now under irrigation. Our water Jindu plain is not the whole province. We must build a greater irrigation system than even Li Ping dreamed of. This alone will double the rice yields. And everywhere, even to Chengdu, we must bring modern machines and modern ways of farming. But these machines, these modern ways, will deprive men of work. They will find other work where they will be needed more, in the new industries of our city. With such advanced ideas, Wei Long... Why do you labor here in the rice field? Well, today is my last day in the field. You leave so soon? The harvesting is not yet over. I must work for many harvests. I am employed by the government now in survey and development. I must report on what is possible here. You have a new bearing and speak of strange new things. You have changed, Wei Lung. You are not the same youth who went from us to the army. No. No, and Zichuan is no longer the sleepy province of my childhood days. We have both grown. We must both look ahead. With its roots sunk deep into the past, Zichuan faces the future with mingled reluctance and zest. For this ancient land, protected on all sides by the Tibetan plateau, was plunged from the isolated existence of a Shangri-La into a combined breadbasket and arsenal for a nation at war. When the Japanese attacked China in 1937, they forced what the Chinese government itself had been unable to accomplish, the opening of Zichuan. Before the bullets and bombs of the enemy, the Chinese retreated from the industrial cities of the coast to the isolated west. Up and down the land sounded the trudging of heavy feet, for the refugees streaming from the coast came heavily burdened. On their backs, they carried the machinery vital to the defense of the land. And in this greatest mass migration of history, the Chinese carried with them the dismantled industry, the schools, churches, and government of the land. And day by day, they were attacked from the air. The Thunderheads rolled over a third of the country, cutting a wide swath of terror, leveling cities, breaking homes setting 50 million lost souls wandering westward. And sustaining the victims were only the words of ancient philosophers. 2,000 years ago, Mencius said, when heaven is about to confer great office upon a man, it first exercises his mind with suffering and his sinews and bones with toil. It exposes his body to hunger and subjects his person to poverty. It confounds his undertakings. By all these methods, it stimulates his mind, tests his temper, and increases his ability to perform the otherwise impossible. Ah, they are coming over again. I must get my gun. When the war reached Zichuan, it brought vast change to a rich stronghold which had been in China, yet not really of China. For the warlords who dominated Zichuan had for a generation ignored the existence of any government but their own. Ah, I am honored that you should confer your illustrious presence on me. Come, let me show you the wonders of my palace. This is one of the warlords of Zichuan. It is indeed a magnificent palace. Oh, but you have not seen the best yet. In this quarter are five more rooms for the bath, built in the finest style of foreign lands. See? This one is tiled in pink. The others are of amber, blue, lavender, and green. This is indeed a marvel. But I am here for a great purpose. Oh, yes, your purpose. Come. We will discuss it over tea. Tea for our guests. The enemy deals China heavy blows. 
Hankow has fallen. My grief is great. But here in Sichuan, we are safe, are we not? There is no safety anywhere from the planes and bombs. They will strike here, too, unless we take many steps for defense. What do you wish us to do? First, you must permit us to move our government to the city of Chongqing. Such a thing is not easily done. Your tea, Generalissimo. Thank you. We must use Chongqing for our government headquarters. Without such an organized center from which to direct the war, all of China, including the province of Zichuan, may be lost. You and your brother lords would be murdered, or the impoverished slaves of the Japanese. This is a most grave crisis. I must confer with others. Then we will inform you on our decision. The hour for decision runs quickly out. We will inform you with due haste. Reluctantly, the warlords granted permission to establish the wartime capital at Chongqing. The city was bombed. This offered valid reason to take control of the city and of eastern Zichuan. The warlords were obliged to send troops to the front, more than three million from the province. But they still controlled the right on which the cities and armies depended. In the spring of 1941... You sent for me... H.H. H. Kung, finance minister and vice premier, stands before his brother-in-law. Yes. I have great new work for you. The landlords of Zichuan collect their rents in rice, as you know. But they pay their land taxes in inflated money. How well I know this. They also hoard the rice, which causes prices to rise even higher, while men lack food. We must nationalize the land tax. The owners of land will pay their taxes not to the provincial government, but directly to us. They will not pay in paper money, but in rice, wheat, and hard grain. Thus, our government will be able to feed our armies and civilian employees. I leave this great task to you. I am pleased with your confidence in me. The wheelbarrows rolled in that fall, piled high with bulging sacks of rice, bringing vital food and China's greatest reform of centuries. From Zichuan alone came almost a million tons of grain, and Chongqing became the war capital of free China. Dynamite blasted shelters out of the cliffs of Chongqing. Government was housed, scores of arsenals and great industries built. 400,000 men working almost with bare hands built great airfields for American superports. Each one supplied most of the nation's coal, most of the alcohol used in place of gasoline. 62 million bushels of rice in 1944 to help feed free China. <laughs> But bringing the 30 centuries-old province up to date was not without trial. In the city of Chongqing in the summer of 1944... Oranges! I have oranges! Mulberries, fresh and sweet! Sugar for those sour mulberries! Who will buy goat skin? Pig bristles! I could stand the noise if it wasn't for this infernal heat, Doc. It's got me plumb melted down to bone and gristle. Well, a Texan should be used to heat, Thomas. In front of American Army headquarters, a technical sergeant of engineers and a major in the medics try without success to fan themselves cool in the withering heat. So this is the town they call the Pittsburgh of Asia. I'll take El Paso any day of the week. I don't doubt it. They also call Chungking the hot spot of the Yangtze Valley. And in summer, it's easy to see why. Yeah, I think I'll move out and buy me a mess of mulberries and that peddler. Might be cool. Don't be an idiot. You know the orders. No food except the rations served at mess. Mm, but I'm plum pot. <laughs> You'll be plum full of cholera if you aren't careful. Haven't you seen how those peddlers sprinkle their fruit with water from the open street corner wells? Any sewage can flow into those wells. By tomorrow, the city will bar all fruits. And all the restaurants are out of bounds now. It's sure monotonous. Monotony's easier on the system than cholera. Well, say, aren't the Chinese taking any measures against the cholera? Yes, they're inoculating all those who will submit to shots and also banning the sale of peeled fruits. And it looks like a bad epidemic this year. Well, how many so far? More than a thousand cases. Mm-hmm. Oh, say, here comes Charlie with another load of Chinese. Yep, yeah, more inoculations. Well, I'll have to get busy. The breather's over. The cholera plague broke out. Chongqing's worst epidemic in years. 600 died. 
coupled with it was the economic plague of inflation. Fountain pen. What is the price now? Uh, Sixty thousand dollars. For a fountain pen set? No, thank you. Oh, very fine set. No one sell it cheaper. I'll do without it. If the heat ain't making me see things, it's way long. Good old numbers long. Bill, Bill Thomas. Oh, am I glad to see you, my friend. It's been two years. Yep, in London. Still figuring out things? Oh, a little. But I can't figure out how I can pay $60,000 for a fountain pen set. Boy, that's what I call robbery. It is fortunate I'm not a civilian. Do you know the price of a tailor-made suit here today? $110,000. Can't they do anything about it? No effective remedy is possible until the Japanese are cleared away from the coast and ports open to bring goods to the interior. Prices here are 1,500 times as high as in 1937. Yeah, they're even charging for water now. Yes, yeah, since the water works shut down, every drop has to be carried by coolies throughout the city at $700 a bucket. Not fit to drink unless you boil or chlorinate it, or both. One can always turn to Yunnan rum, only 12000 a bottle. Numbers, if you ask me, yours each one smells. Oh, do not say that, my friend. This vast green province is bountiful, rich with food and minerals of every kind. Have you seen our great green fields? Have you seen the miracles of production from our factories? The good black smoke of industry rising into the sky? You can say that again. If the sun ever gets through the smoke and mist over Chungking, it's a miracle, all right. Oh, there are discomforts. But they should not make you see Chungking in the wrong light. A city on a cliff, shut in by a stone wall a hundred feet high. Narrow streets winding all over the place. Cholera, inflation. Oh, the evils will pass. The good things will remain. Once the war has been won and reconstruction has been completed, Chongqing and all each one will become the center of the new China. Numbers, all I want is to get back to Texas. Well, that is what your mouth speaks, my friend. It is not what your heart believes. Great things will take place here in Golden Sichuan. <laughs> the Japanese surrender brought happy celebration to Zichuan. The victory firecrackers popped incessantly on August 15th, and the joyous crowds of Chongqing yanked Americans from their streets and jeeps. Hey, what is this? Where are you hombres taking me? Oh, don't worry, Bill. You're among friends. Numbers. You with this mob? Where are we going? The war is over, my friend. We've won. We are taking our American brothers to the wine shop. Would you prefer a shot of Ching Pao juice or some fine vodka? Well, you coax me into it. I'll try them both, partner. In victory, Chung King, like all each one, dreams upon its hour of wartime greatness and ponders over its future. The leader of the nation, as he makes ready for departure, pauses to tell the Chung King officials... Chongqing will continue to be the auxiliary capital of China. The necessary organization will remain here to carry on the task of the city's reconstruction. I have great interest in this rebuilding. At least once a year, I will come back here. An American reporter questions a city official about Chongqing's future. They've been telling me you have a number of ambitious projects for the city. What are some of your plans? Oh, we have many undertakings in store. Here, have you seen these? Engineer's drawings. Bridges, eh? Yes. Two great bridges to span the Yangtze and Chiling rivers which flank the city. Say, this one looks like quite a project. You may well say so. This bridge to be named after the Generalissimo will cross the Yangtze. Hmm. Reminds me of the George Washington Bridge in the United States. The other bridge is to be smaller, I see. Yes. This one is to be known as the Victory Bridge. It will span the Chiling. Just how long will it be before these bridges are up? Oh, I am not certain, but... I hope they can be completed within a few years. Oh, it sounds a little speedy to me, but I hope you're right. There isn't any way of linking the bridges, is there? Yes. Eventually, the two will be joined by a tunnel cut to the rock of Chungking. But these things are only a portion of the ten-year plan for Chungking. Already, we are widening streets, clearing up slums on the riverfront, planning a great sewage system for the two-thirds of the city, which now has none. I've seen one of the streets being widened. I guess you really mean business about bringing Chungking up to date. We do indeed. But this will become a most modern city. Oh, oh, a thousand pardons. I thought you were alone. Oh, come in, Wei. 
Uh, this gentleman is seeking information for the American press about the future of Chungking and Sichuan. Oh? Of what things can I inform you, sir? Well, I've... I've heard conflicting reports on the actual extent of the industrial development launched in this province during the war. Oh, I know the new industries were often kept secret for security reasons while the war was on, but there's no reason for secrecy today, is there? No, no, we can now speak freely of many things which were hidden before. As to the extent of development, it may interest you that more than $500 million was invested in industrial and mining enterprises of our province. Hmm, that much. Uh, that was by 1943. The figures have risen since. Our first iron and steel plant has uh, been completed in the spring of 1940. You seem to have plenty of bituminous coal mines along the Yangtze Valley. Yes, and other coal and iron producing centers are in the Min and Chiling Valleys. Of course, you know that the name Zichuan signifies four rivers. The Yangtze Kiang is composed of the Min, To, Fu, and Chilang rivers. Mm, wh what about your alcohol distilleries, which produced so much substitute fuel in place of gasoline? These distilleries were built along the Tu River in order to use the sugar cane. The blast furnaces and machine industries were conveniently established near the mines. Isn't salt one of your big industries, too? Yes, yes, we have much salt extraction by brine pumping. In fact, we have many mining activities of which your countrymen may be unaware. West of the Min River, we mine copper, gold, silver, lead, and antimony. Mm -hmm. How much petroleum do you have in Sichuan? It has been estimated at almost 400 million barrels. I understand you've discovered several new reserves. That Kiangyu deposit near Chengdu. Your experts and ours have decided it is a good source of petroleum. The richest deposit in all China. An isolated province of ancient China is coming of age today. The wheels of its industry, set in motion by war, continue to hum in peace. Now awakened, it cannot return to its slumbers. Its 50 million people can never slip back to the hermitage existence of the past. The old commerce will continue. Out of Chungking, there still flows the silk, jade, tea, semi-precious stones, and rare brocades from the rich surrounding province. The shops of the city still display the tapestries and precious jewels from the mountain regions of Tibet. But the ribbons of transportation and the lines of communication keep advancing and each one is no longer remote from the outside world. Wei Lung! Hey, numbers! No, no, I don't believe it. It really is you, uh, Bill. <laughs> I thought you'd gone back to the United States. I did. Got my discharge, went back to work for my old firm, engineering. Oh. Thought I was parked back home for good. Well, before I knew what was happening, they had me roped, hogtied, and shipped right back out here again. <laughs> And you were the one who swore you'd never return to Chongqing once you were back in Texas. Uh, I'm plumb surprised at the way things shaped up myself. My firm's kind of interested in developments here. Knowing I was stationed here during the war, they decided to send me back to help out on a little survey job. Ah, oh, survey job. Uh, tell me, have you been near Ichang lately? Yeah. I've been having me a look at the possible site for the largest dam and hydroelectric plant in the world. I know the site. It could prove several times greater than your famous TVA. Uh, you're plenty right about that, partner. It'd work wonders for your agriculture and industry. Give you all the power you could need. We will have it, someday. I'd like to check with you in detail on what you found out there, Bill. Well, what's up, Phil? Well, I'm making a report to a government commission soon on methods of expanding and implementing a program for greater development of each one. You may be able to give me much valuable information some ammunition for my little attack on the status quo. Well, sure, I'll be glad to help. You come over to my hotel. So you're in civvies, too, and working for the government. Right. Well, I'm sure tickled to know that, Numbers. Well, I'm happy at the way our paths have been crossing, Bill. It indicates we're not so far from the outside world. By the way, what do you think of Chungking now? Well, it could still use a little sunlight. But I see some changes, all right. Now, take this street. They're really going ahead and widening it. Yes, Chung Erlu is but one of our modernizing projects. Where the houses get in the way, you just slice off hunks of them like you slice cheese. What happens to the people who lose their homes by this street widening? Well, they're being housed in buildings vacated by the government. Have you been uptown lately? Yeah, just this morning. 
No more climbing up all those stone steps, I find. The funicular railway zips you up to the top like a breeze. Well, the city has plans for several of these railways to travel up the steep sides of the city. A small improvement, perhaps, but only one of a very long series. <laughs> To the planners of the new and greater Zichuan, the road ahead is clear. Continuation of the modernization begun during the war and even greater investments for agriculture and industry. In a conference hall, the planners, the old men and the young men, like Wei Long, gather to compare their findings. Now, illustrious elders of this body, I give you the Jendu Plain as a model. Here, to these 400,000 acres, Li Ping's ancient irrigation system means a rich yield, more than 90 bushels of rice per acre. This is twice that of unirrigated fields. In addition, there is another crop of beans or wheat, and sometimes a third crop. If the whole province were brought to the level of Chengdu, what would the total output be? 600 million bushels, and by improved methods, the rice crop can increase 20 to 40 percent, cotton 20 to 50 percent, wheat by introducing new strains up to 20 percent. You roll these figures out glibly. Are you a farmer? No, no, but I have worked on farms and consulted experts of many lands. You have already been told that local sugar can yield 1,500 pounds per acre, while a strain from India gives 3,600 pounds. It is such improvements we seek for each one. But the starting point is irrigation through the great hydroelectric plant possible near Ichang. But the cost would be enormous. The results would be enormous, too. We must dream no little dreams. Our agriculture would be greatly benefited by this project. So, too, would our industry. Cheap power would aid small plants in rural regions as well as large ones in our cities. It would make possible great improvements in transportation and communication. But will not fewer workers be needed on the land? Will not men be idle? There will be new jobs in industry. We must create a foundation to help raise the living standard of the 450 million people of China. This is the promise of our tomorrow. Each one must lead in bringing it to fulfillment. Expansion waits on international loans and national unity. But men of vision seek to shake off the past and to grasp a greater future. In the next decade, China may rise to become a great nation. And each one may prove the guiding force. have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. Tonight's specific story was produced and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. 
This program comes to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.